Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's lecture. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Chairman Kim Reed uh, as our inaugural distinguished lecturer in this speaker series. Um, uh, Chairman Reed's 20-year career has uh, focused, has existed at the intersection of law and business, something that is very near and dear to my heart as a former uh, international trade lawyer. She has led efforts focused on American job creation, trade, economic development, food and agricultural and agriculture and government reform, and currently she is at uh, Exim, the Export-Import Bank, where she oversees approximately $135 billion dollars in capital for loans. I wish we had that budget here. Let's, let's talk afterwards. Um, she helps to get American companies into the area of uh, artificial intelligence and 5G networks. Uh, these industries will be transformational, not only for the American public, uh, but for national uh, security as well. So again, this is our first lecture series that we have created in collaboration between the John Chambers College of Business and Economics at WVU and the College of Law, and we have some of our friends from the College of Business and Economics here. And uh, in trying to create this series, there were a number of challenging choices to make, where to do it, uh, the law school or the business school. Actually, that wasn't that hard. We do it at the law school, right? <laughs> Who would do the introductions? Uh, Dean Javier Reyes of uh, the Chambers College or me at the law school? Well, actually, that was a pretty easy decision. Uh, that was me. And more importantly, who would pay for it? Uh, and uh, that wasn't all us. We actually split the cost on this one, so that's wonderful. So that's to say that um, many of the procedural things that we had to deal with were challenging, but what was not hard was who to choose for our first speaker. Uh, and in the spirit of Mountaineers Go First, um, we chose Chairman Reed. Uh, Chairman Reed is the first woman elected as chair to the Republican National Lawyers Association. She is the first woman to lead XM. And most importantly, she is the first West Virginian and WVU law graduate uh, to lead XM. So Chairman Reed is clearly a leader, not only in business, uh, but in the law. And we're very proud of her accomplishments. And we're very, very proud to claim her as uh, an alum of this school and a friend. And since we are dealing in a world of firsts and leaders, uh, it was natural that she was chosen first for the speaker series. So please join me in giving a warm mountaineer welcome to our first speaker in the Dean's Lecture Series, uh, Chairman Kimberly Reed. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Bowman, for that kind introduction. Normally, uh, I like to speak extemporaneously, but this is your inaugural lecture of the law school and the business school. And when I attended here from 1993 to 1996, I attended lectures like this. And um, the presenter usually um, uh, read their, their remarks. So I'm going to do that. Do I have the editor of the law review here? Well, hello. Maybe I'll submit this for publication. We'll see. OK, you're going to have to tell me if it meets your specs. I did not uh, uh, publish when I was at the law school, so may maybe I will do it uh, today. So I'm going to read this, but uh, look forward to uh, talking with all of you. Thank you, uh, Dean Bowman. We last saw each other, along with West Virginia University President uh, Gee at uh, West Virginia's Chamber of Commerce's 83rd meeting and business summit this past August at the Greenbrier. I also would like to thank and recognize Chambers College of Business and Economics Dean Reyes and uh, Law School Associate Dean Tu. I'm excited to be back at West Virginia University of College of Law, my alma mater, and deeply uh, am honored to be with you to present the inaugural WVU College of Law and Chambers College of Business Distinguished Lecture. Today, I want to share some key points on the value of growing up in West Virginia, my career trajectory, which is focused on job creation, trade, economic development, and government reform, the history and purpose of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, or EXIM as we are known today, and where this agency is headed. I also want to explain how EXIM operates in a fiercely competitive global marketplace and how the agency is keeping America strong, including for businesses and workers in, here in West Virginia. Growing up in Buchanan, West Virginia, and being educated in the Mountain State, my home among the hills, instilled in me those core mountaineer values, service, curiosity, respect, accountability, and appreciation that we all share and continue to be the foundation of my life. 
But I did not always think I would end up in law school, and I certainly did not think I would end up as president and chairman of the board of directors of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. I would like to recognize my father, Terry Reed, who currently practices law with my brother, Mark, in Buchanan. When I was born in 1971 in Charleston, my father uh, was committed to public service as a special assistant to Governor Archmore, the father of Senator Kelly, Shelley Moore Capito. I am told that my first word as a toddler was the word more. Of course, my father was very impressed that I was saying the governor's last name, M-O-O-R-E. Of course, some would say that I was a born leader proclaiming, I want more of this and I want more of that, be it jobs, economic growth, or, or America's great agricultural products like milk and baby food. But my father is a great teacher and we both know that I was communicating not only my first word, but my first double entendre. Four more years. That's a joke for, uh, for those of us who are around when uh, Governor Moore was in office. Um, Daddy, thank you for all you have done for me. Not only do you teach me about the law, you have taught me by example about so many important things in life. It was such an honor to have you with me as an eighth grader in 1985 when Governor Moore knighted me as a lady of the Order of the Golden Horseshoe for being a top scorer on the statewide West Virginia history test. I wear my Golden Horseshoe pin today with immense pride. Do we have any Golden Horseshoe winners in the audience? Yay. I'm going to be buried with this pin. <laughs> I work so hard on it. Thank you also, Daddy, for standing with me as I was sworn into the West Virginia State Bar, and then 22 years later, next to me holding our family Bible in the Oval Office when President Trump and Vice President Pence administered my oath as the first woman and the first West Virginian to lead the Export-Import Bank of the United States. In addition to my father, I have other important mentors and teachers in my life. I encourage each of you to have the same, as a network of mentors will help you develop as, as a professional and support you throughout your life. I would like to share two examples of how professors set me on my current trajectory. When it came time to enroll at West Virginia Wesleyan College, I wanted to be a doctor. I majored in biology and minored in chemistry, but because of a government professor who inspired me, I ended up getting a second major in government. Do we have any West Virginia Westland grads here? Yay, Bobcats. Um, during my freshman year, I took a course taught by Dr. Robert Rupp. Did you have Dr. Robert Rupp? Yay. Uh, entitled Kennedy Catholicism in the 1960 West Virginia Primary, which focused on Kennedy's journey to the White House. We learned how West Virginia, the West Virginia Primary was a pivotal election for then candidate Kennedy. It showed a rural Protestant state could vote for a Catholic from Boston. In 1963, Kennedy said, I would not be where I am now. I would not have some of the responsibilities for which I now bear if it had not been for the people of West Virginia. During this class, Dr. Rupp challenged me to interview West Virginia Secretary of State Ken Heckler about his insights from the 1960 campaign. As a shy 18-year-old freshman, I could not fathom doing such a thing. Yet Dr. Rupp gave me the courage to ask big, make the request, and then get out of my comfort zone and show up to meet the man who had firsthand knowledge on an important part of our state's history. I will never forget sitting across from Secretary Heckler in his office in the magnificent Gold Dome, West Virginia State Capitol. In hindsight, I learned more about myself during that class and at that interview than I did about the election of 1960. I discovered that I really enjoyed learning about policy, history, law, government, international relations, and politics, and engaging with people on these topics. These things were in my DNA. They were my passion. Then it came uh, time to decide what direction to take after completing my undergraduate degree, and the choice was clear. I set my sights on law school and wound up sitting right where you are today, and even attended similar guest lectures just like this one. In June 1993, the summer before I began law school, I read in the newspaper, because this is before I had the internet, uh, I read in the newspaper that a big national convention was taking place in Charleston. 
Remembering the lesson that Dr. Rupp taught me a few years earlier about having the courage to ask big and show up, I immediately got in my car and drove from Buchanan to Charleston and bought a ticket on the spot without knowing anyone at the convention. How many of you would do that? You read about a national convention, happens to be in Charleston, get in your car, go, and just insert yourself. I soon found myself in a room with hundreds of young leaders from throughout the United States listening to a speech on President Abraham Lincoln. I, along with the rest of the room, was absolutely mesmerized by this dynamic speaker. He punctuated his remarks from time to time with the statement, it's a thing called character, and Lincoln had it. During his speech, the or this or orator extraordinaire with a full head of snow white hair and a thick white mustache took me back to my eighth grade West Virginia history class when he noted that the story of the creation of West Virginia is the story of triumph of character in the times of difficulty. He understood, uh, he underscored that President Lincoln stood up for what he believed and gave us our West Virginia statehood. It's a thing called character, and Lincoln had it. From that moment, and the hair was standing up on my arms because of the speaker, I knew my destiny was to further issues important to West Virginia at the federal level. Imagine how I fe felt just a few months later when this dynamic, white-haired speaker stood in front of me again here in this very building. My jaw dropped when Dr. Jack Bowman walked into the classroom as my professor on Contracts One, I learned so much from him. I am so honored, sir, that you're here today. Thank you. You need to know this guy, and that's his son. <laughs> my experience at West Virginia Westland College of Law set me on this path. Going to law school does not confine you to become a so-called traditional lawyer, but rather opens doors to do great things, which is exactly what President Trump told me to do when I was sworn in as chairman of XM. In many ways, the lessons I learned at the law school and early in my career have guided me, uh, guided my path in public service and the work that I'm doing at XM. Thank you again, Professor Bowman because it's a thing called character, and people like you in this school have it. Thank you. To the faculty and staff, I offer this reminder. Your actions today, both in and out of the classroom, make a big difference in the lives of your students. Your students will not forget their time here. They are always watching and will remember those of you who lead by example. It's a thing called character, and I thank those of you who take the extra step to make a positive difference in your students' lives. Thank you for preparing our 21st century lawyers and leaders to serve in public, government, and business, whether in West Virginia, across our great nation, or around the world, while focusing on justice, ethics, professionalism, and service in a diverse, vibrant, and respectful community. After graduating from law school, I began my career on Capitol Hill serving as a counsel to three different congressional committees, where I focused on oversight and reform to improve our federal agencies. I deeply appreciate the valuable role Congress plays in oversight of federal pro programs, including XM, and the importance of faithfully executing all laws consistent with the intent of Congress. For all of the students, let me share a bit of advice. Pay attention in your legal research and writing class. Are you taking that right now? Raise your hand if you're taking it. It will be the most important class you take here. I'm sorry to all the professors and your favorite subjects. This one is the most important class as it develops critical skills you will use every day for the rest of your life. If I would have known how important chapter five of studying law, an introduction to legal research by Jake Clark Kelso, and yes, this was my book from 1993, uh, which focuses on sources of legislative law. When I was a 1L, I would have mastered it and peppered my professor with many more questions. I see the, say this with all honesty, as I, as a congressional counsel in the legislative branch, was responsible to quote Kelso for laws made in pursuance of the Constitution. And now serving in the executive branch, I'm charged with implementing and enforcing the law. I have to testify uh, before Congress on Wednesday, and you can be sure that I will remember my 1L legal research class exercises if I have to underscore relevant federal legislative history when responding to questions. 
I also had the privilege of serving as senior advisor to two Treasury Secretaries of the United States, John Snow and Henry Paulson, where we worked to strengthen our nation's economy. This taught, the this taught me the value of working as part of an administration's team to ensure and ensuring Congress and the American people were fully informed about the President's economic uh, agenda. While at Treasury, I also wanted to get line management experience, so I headed something called the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, where I focused on making a different, positive difference in poor parts of our country, including here in West Virginia. And most recently, as president of the International Food Information Council Foundation, I worked with our U.S. Departments of Agriculture and States, but also with multilateral institutions. How many of you are taking international law here or have taken it? Raise your hand. So some of the inter multilateral institutions that uh, I've engaged with include the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. So all of these things led me to my, my uh, current place, and I want to share with you a brief history on the Export-Import Bank of the United States. How many of you have heard of Exim? How many of you feel like you know about Exim? Okay, maybe someone will take a seminar class and I will prompt you to focus on the Exim story. My non-traditional legal background taught me that it's important to know where you're coming from when looking to the future. And so when President Trump nominated me to be the head of Exim, I dug into the history of the agency. President Franklin D. Roosevelt established Exim, but it was then called the Export-Import Bank of Washington in 1934. The agency was originally founded to help normalize relations with the Soviet Union by financing U.S. exports. However, due to the Soviet Union's history and record of unpaid debts, it soon became clear any transaction would be improbable and likely impossible altogether. Consequently, a month later, the second Export-Import Bank of Washington was formed, this time with lending authority uh, to any part of the world except Russia. The second Export-Import Bank of Washington first transaction approved was a loan of $3.8 million to Cuba for the purchase of U.S. silver ignits. Following by its first transaction in Europe, a loan for $1.3 million for the purchase of tobacco. Then shortly thereafter came the first transaction in South America for the purchase of Victor pens from the U.S. Fountain Pen Company, totaling $10,000. Imagine how many pens that would buy back then, literally a full ship. Then came the first transaction in Asia, uh, $100,000 to purchase printing presses from the Duplex Printing Company, and the first transaction in Africa, $300,000 authorized to construct port facilities. This was just the start of the agency getting more American goods and services into the international markets. By 1935, the Export-Import Bank of, and the second Export-Import Bank merged, creating our one agency, the Export-Import Bank of Washington. The agency expanded to support American companies as they exported their products abroad. It became involved in several mon monumental international development programs that had a, tra a transformational impact around the road, world. In 1938, the agency loaned $25 million to China for the purchase of U.S. agriculture and industry products. These products allowed China to mean a supply line between Burma and China's wartime capital of Chongqing, what is now called the Burma Road. And while the loan was officially a commercial endeavor, it unofficially defined the agency as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy, supporting the Chinese in the Sino-Japanese War. This was the first time the agency publicly became a policy instrument used as a bargaining chip in congressional maneuvering, trends we coincidentally didn't we see playing out today? In 1941, the agency financed the Pan American Highway, a road traveling through Canada, the United States, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. Then, following World War II, the agency was instrumental in guaranteeing many of the Marshall Plan's credits to Europe, European countries to assist in the reconstruction of Europe. And you know that we just celebrated the 75th anniversary of World War II. These loans were important. In 1945 alone, we authorized more than $2 billion for post-World War II reconstruction. And these included loans to France for general materials and construction, and even $19 million to the 
Prague Credit Bank for the purchase of cotton exports. Our role in Europe, Europe's reconstruction, demonstrated the need for the agency to have a drastically higher lending capacity and paved the way for Congress to pass the Export-Import Bank of 1945 which converted the organization into an independent federal agency and increased its federal lending authority to $3.5 billion. And in 1968, we were modernized to uh, what we are today, our name, Exim or Export-Import Bank of the United States, which actually uh, more accurately reflects the true scope of our reach. While my job is full-time, that was not always the case. Jesse Jones, for example, was chairman from 1941 to 43. He then became Commerce Secretary during World War II. For a period, it was just one of 32 jobs he held within the government. Secretary Jones's influence over the country was so fast during the FDR administration that he was referred to on multiple occasions as the fourth branch of government. It is rumored that he lived in what is now my office at XM with a Murphy bed hidden in the closet opposite my desk. I also have heard that America's wartime economy during uh, World War II was planned in, a, in the small dining room off my office. We were, we were reauthorized again in 1997, where Congress gave us a new mandate to focus in on Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the rest of the world at the same time. So now, today, we're open for business in 191 countries, and we have the delegated authority of $135 billion and support jobs in every state. As the official export credit agency of our country, we are self-sustaining. We operate at no cost to the U.S. taxpayer. We achieve this uh, in two principal ways. When the U.S. exporters or their international buyers are unable to accept access export financing from private sources, the agency equips them with the necessary tools, such as buyer financing, export credit insurance, insurance or working capital. Second, when U.S. exports face foreign competition backed by other governments, our U.S. XM helps level the playing field by providing buyer financing to match or counter the financing offered by competing nations and their export credit agencies. We assume credit and country risks when the private sector is unable or unwilling to extend financing. And we really want to be a difference all around the world. And I, as, when I was confirmed, I faced one major battle, and that is we had to be reauthorized. There are now 113 foreign export credit agencies around the world, and our XM has to be reauthorized from time to time by Congress. So after I was confirmed, I had to lead our agency to secure reauthorization. And that process took uh, uh, all of my time. And I am so happy that the President of the United States, who was against the bank when he was running for office, changed his mind, and he said, I believe in Exim. I believe in U.S. workers, I believe in U.S. jobs, and I want to reauthorize Exim for the longest tenure in the history of the United States. Ten years, he said. And Congress came back, they normally reauthorize us three, four, five years at a time. And that reauthorization is important because it allows the Congress, the legislative branch, to do due diligence on us. But this time, they listened, and I helped share the story that the president was sharing, and we were reauthorized for seven years, the longest tenure in the history of our bank. And so now I'm working hard as can be, and will be testifying before Congress on Wednesday, because our mission is supporting U.S. jobs. How many of you have heard about the Belt and Road Initiative? So what's happening right now in the world? I also want to challenge each of you to read the news every day. <coughs> you need to be smart and not live in your bubble. You need to see what you're doing plays into the larger context of things. And uh, so what's happening right now is China is growing its influence around the world, and they have three XMs. And they do something called debt diplomacy, debt trap diplomacy, where they make a loan to a foreign purchaser but that foreign purchaser might really not be able to pay up. So guess what China does then when they default? They acquire the asset. And so there are strategic locations around the world, the port in Djibouti, a port in Sri Lanka, 
um, that China now controls. And so when we got reauthorized at XM, Congress told me, of your $135 billion portfolio that you can be loaning a, 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 a out at any one time, 20% of it needs to be focused on taking on China directly. And so I'm setting up a program right as we speak to do that. How can we do that? It's a big task. And so um, it's going to take a lot of work. I'm hiring staff. And we really want to be sure that we are ever present in the world when it comes to really important technologies like 5G, like quantum computing, and basic services like water sanitation. So, so we're very focused on that. I'm also focused on transforming our agency. When I was confirmed after a two and a half year confirmation process, which is a story in itself, uh, one senator from Pennsylvania who's a critic of the bank asked me under oath at my confirmation hearing six basic questions. So how would you answer these questions under oath? Will you increase transparency? I said yes. Will you strengthen taxpayer protections? I said yes. Will you improve protection for domestic companies from economic harm? Yes, sir. Will you ensure that XM does not crowd out private sector financing? Yes. Will you crack down on bad actors? Absolutely. And finally, will you reduce reliance on export credit agencies globally? I said yes. So I worked behind the scenes with the critics of the bank, built goodwill, promised to transform our agency, and answered these six questions under oath. So you know what it means to answer questions under oath. You've got to do it, and your credibility is on the line. So I'm also, in addition to reopening XM, I am focused on these, these transformations, and everything I do every day is guided by that. And it's also guided by each of you. My job is to protect the taxpayer. My mission, and our mission, is supporting U.S. jobs through exports. But I need to protect what we do. And so as an application comes into us from a foreign purchaser, that, applica that applicant, and let's just give a hypothetical. Actually, it's a real case. Uh, uh, Mozambique, country of Mozambique in Africa, they have an untapped reserve of LNG off their shoreline. And what's in the ground could transform their country's economy, transform the lives of its citizens. And so um, Exim, when we were shut because I was not confirmed for four years, um, Mozambique said, we want to build this LNG facility, and we need help. Apply, and China applied, and Russia applied, and they're getting ready to sign this big contract where $5 billion of goods and services from Russia and China, made by Russian and Chinese workers, were going to go to Mozambique to help Mozambique build this LNG facility. That's a strategic asset. Um, so then we get confirmed, and we get a call from the Mozambique government, we want to buy Made in USA. And I'm like, great, let's have an application come in. And we were thrilled after due diligence. We have 400 staff who are underwriters. I have now a, a, a head of risk, a head of ethics. We put forth for a board vote um, this $5 billion deal, the largest deal in the history of export-import banking in the United States, to provide that. And we said yes, and they said yes, and they kicked Russia and China out of the deal. And so now 16,400 U.S. workers in states, including Pennsylvania, Florida, and Ohio, and others, uh, now get to make their great stuff and export their goods and services to this country to help them. So I think that's a good thing. And we make sure that we get repaid, and we charge interest and fees to the foreign buyer on everything we do. And when we're normally fully operational, uh, since the mid-90s, we have brought into the tre U.S. Treasury $9.6 billion because of this, these fees and interest. And we have a 0.5% default rate, which is better than any bank. We're the en envy of the financial markets. But we have a special role where the financial, private financial sector might not be able to go because of things like Dodd-Frank and Basel III, for those of you who are taking business classes, um, or because... Um, the foreign purchaser requires the full faith and credit of the country that they want to buy the goods from. So we're hard at work now. 
I've got $50 billion on our book, so that means we can go another $85 billion. We're knocking on doors. We're figuring out where China is. And I'm just really um, honored um, to be here with you. And I just am so happy that you're taking your lunchtime um, to focus in on uh, a West Virginia me and, and the message I have for you. So I want to focus again on West Virginia. Small business is very important to me. I'm from Buchanan, Upshur County. We have Westland grads. How about Buchanan uh, residents? Yay, what's your name? Okay. Okay, wonderful. Daddy, do you know him? Yes, okay. <laughs> this is what's great about being from West Virginia. Um, so small business is the backbone of my hometown, and I'm actually going to be Deanna Buchanan at the Chamber of Commerce's annual dinner tonight. But what this instilled in me, and I know it is for all of you, uh, small business is key to the backbone of our state. So since I've become chairman, I've prioritized what we do on small business. And we've done 1,400 small business transactions totaling $1.49 billion. And this supports about 12,000 jobs. Over the past five years, XM has benefited for about $12 million of that. And 57% of these uh, businesses in West Virginia, there's just 15 so far, uh, but 57% are small businesses. I want to do even more, and that's why I'm here in my home state. We supported, for example, a $2 million uh, policy to help Wheeling Truck Center in Wheeling export through our export credit insurance program. Exports now make up 25% of the company's revenue. And uh, they've been now a great longtime customer. And if you go to our website, you can see the 15 companies that have used XM over the past five years. So in closing, I want to share with you the new vision I created for XM, keeping America strong, empowering US businesses and workers to compete globally. For those of you in business school and in law school, you're gonna have to develop strategic plans when you get out in the real world where you're going to have a mission with goals and measurables, and then you have to have a long-term vision. So my vision is empowering our U.S. workers and businesses to compete globally because economic and national security is so important to each of us. I am so honored to be the first woman and the first West Virginian to deliver uh, on this vision for the American taxpayer, and I'm so happy to be here delivering this very first inaugural law school and business school lecture. I also look forward to watching each of you as your stars rise, as you are West Virginia's future legal and business leaders. And I want to encourage you to reach big. Like Dr. Rupp told me, make those asks and show up, and you'll be surprised where you get in life. And I always remember what Professor Bowman taught me. It's a thing called character, and as West Virginians, you have it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have some time for a few questions. People have questions? I'm going to start us off. Good afternoon. How much of the global market share is expected to return to the United States? Well, I hope uh, when it comes to XM, uh, we get more. And, that's, and so again, we uh, tell the foreign world, come by us. And, uh, and we are that special tool in the trade toolbox. And so um, I want to see more and more of it happen. We're reopened, we're getting, imagine being shut for four years, how do you get the applications coming in again if your bank was shut for four years? So we are that special tool. And now that Congress has given us this huge mandate to take China on directly, I think that we're going to be seeing more of that. And, and I'm really looking forward to celebrating all across this great land uh, the jobs that we, uh, we are creating and will be creating uh, during my tenure at XM and beyond. Thank you. Um, if China and Russia have similar uh, lending programs to uh, go out to the rest of the world and provide financing, um, how do you compete and what makes your lending program more appealing to uh, developing countries? The United States belongs to something called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. 
along with other countries, but those are not the majority of the world. So we adhere to um, uh, our fees and our interest rates and the rules that we apply. I follow US law, but also OECD rules. Um, and so my peers in places like Germany and France and the UK, and sometimes we do do co-financing deals because deals can be really complicated. We play by those rules. Well, guess who doesn't play by those rules? China and Russia. And um, we uh, don't want to have a race to the bottom. But now Congress has told us to go in and figure out how we can take some of those deals away. And the biggest asset that we have, and this is why Mozambique came to us, uh, the rest of the world wants to deal with our country. We're transparent, we have rule of law, uh, we're above board, and most importantly, we make the best goods and services around the world. And if you read magazines like The Economist, you'll be reading in Africa where China's doing their, their, uh, their Belt and Road Initiative. They come and they bring their own Chinese workers in to do the deals. And then they maybe don't use as good of equipment. And then maybe bad things happen. So, so um, I want the world to choose us. But uh, in the end, we are the lender of last resort. And I've got to protect your taxpayer dollar. Imagine if this $5 billion deal I just signed our country's name on the line for goes bust. You know, I don't want to do that for all of you. So we've got really strict underwriting, and we do have a 0.5% default rate. Congress um, has charged me now with going out and taking some deals away from China, and the law says finance them on China's terms. So first of all, you got to figure out what those are. That's not transparency uh, in any shape. So we're going to really have to figure that out. But um, luckily, the Congress has also said you have a cap on default of 2%. So I know that we're going to start increasing our risk appetite so we get in there. But it will go between 0.5% and 2%. And I'm still not wanting to put your taxpayer dollar at risk. but with the interest and the fees that we charge and the reserves that we have, we'll do what's best for American workers. Another question. So I have a question. I'll take yep. uh, a li the liberty of the, the speaker, which is uh, what kind of opportunities are there for our students uh, at EXIM Bank? So how many of you have interned in Washington or want to intern in Washington? That's a big conversation. Um, and I shared uh, some comments with uh, your, your professors earlier today about some of that, but there's no rhyme or reason for getting a job in Washington. With XM, we have, a, if you go on usajobs.gov, we have an official internship program you can apply for. But there's other ways you get jobs in Washington as well. Working on Capitol Hill, you've got to go find that member of Congress, beat on their door, and that's exactly what I did to get my foot in the door um, uh, directly. And you got to look on each organization's website and see what they require. And I'm not going to. I'm not doing an advertisement, but I want to be helpful to you. Um, for me, when I was uh, working in my prior job, there's a job list that someone has capitalized on, and that's where I would place my jobs. And it's called BradTraverse.com, and you have to pay ten dollars a month and five dollars every month there thereafter. But that's where uh, work employers in Washington, if they've got a job or an internship, they post it on there because it's all word of mouth. But you can do it. I mean, Washington is such a dynamic place. I moved immediately after law school, didn't know a soul, showed up uh, on the front door of a presidential campaign. And I graduated right when you're graduating. So imagine in May, we have our presidential election in uh, November. So I drove uh, to Washington and showed up on the door of a campaign. My guy lost. Um, so then I sat at home in Washington at a friend's parents' house for five months trying to get a job. Um, and then finally someone told me, just get on the merry-go-round. As a lawyer, just get on the merry-go-round. It doesn't matter where, just get on. And so I applied again to be a free intern. Thank you, dear father, for helping me. Um, and people have to wait tables and work hard, but you get that internship where you then work hard, you prove yourself with the network that you build and then you get your job. But uh, it's not uh, an obvious route, but I'm happy to give any of you advice on that. So usajobs.gov is where you get a normal uh, federal internship, but then the political internships uh, you have to get through other ways, such as volunteering on campaigns or being interns in congressional offices. 
you can do it. All right, so another question. Um, I'm a U Chicago grad. I'm a big fan of free markets, but it seems to me that EXIM is a no-brainer. I mean, you have really low default rates. You're making money. Um, why is it that you have s such difficulty with Republican senators, right, who, who, what is it that they don't understand? And I don't think, thank you, I don't think I went into fully on my nomination. So when the President of the United States was running for office, he was against the Export-Import Bank because he listened to his advisors who support free markets. I'm a free market conservative Republican. True thinking. Do we have anyone who's taken an economics course here? Raise your hand. How about, have you heard of Hayek? So he, the, he is the godfather of this theory. Government should not intervene into uh, government should not intervene into the private sector. It distorts markets. And so, if you are a purist and you look at what that does, um, and we have people in our current White House who still adhere to this philosophy, and many wonderful friends who adhere to this philosophy, it's not the role of government to intervene. But um, and so, the president, when he was running for office, he was against the bank. He's like, this is not the role of government. Then he gets elected, he meets businesses, he meets workers, and they basically say we're getting our clocks cleaned because we don't have this tool called XM to help us compete because it's not a pure world and it's an unlevel playing field because 112 other export credit agencies around the world are getting the jobs uh, to their workers. So the president did a 180 and he said, all right, I'm going to reopen the bank. And he nominated me and then set me on a path for two and a half years of bridge building. Um, so it's, the, it's in a perfect world, and I promised Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania, in a perfect world we should not have this, but I will not unilaterally disarm. And you're right, we protect the taxpayer. We, we give billions of dollars to the U.S. Treasury that we didn't have before. We help our workers compete and win. And we're going to do that now through 2026. Uh, thanks to the leadership of our president. And I was confirmed by the United States Senate. I got a 100% Democrat vote on my nomination, yes. So the vote was 79 to 17. And 100% uh, Democrat, yes. Bernie Sanders voted no. Uh, Elizabeth Warren voted yes. But it was a, a Bernie Sanders and 16 uh, true believing Republicans. And you have to respect their end goal of uh, not interfering in the, in the private marketplace. But... We're here, and I'm going to make it go the best I can. Yep. Hey. Uh, nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Yes, nice to see you as well. Um, so where would you say globally that we are seeing so many American goods? Like what countries are wanting a lot of American goods, and where in America really are they manufacturing the most um, to send abroad? Yeah. Well, without XM, our biggest uh, trading partners are Canada and Mexico. And then actually China after that. Um, and so you know that we just signed this historic UC, uh, USMCA agreement to help with that. China phase one. Uh, and then the role of XM, uh, we go where the private sector doesn't want to go. So, um, so where, we're, where we're doing deals is all over the world where it's not as easy for the private sector. And so, uh, so far we have brought um, before the board um, this Mozambique deal I mentioned to you, a $5 billion deal supporting 16,000 jobs. Just voted on one uh, in Argentina for oil and gas equipment. Uh, done two preliminary commitments in Iraq, and we voted on those before the latest um, issues that we've seen in the press. So we'll see if we, we actually uh, get those done. And then we're working uh, to finalize deals in Cameroon, Senegal. So, uh, so that's just kind of some of the places that we're operating right now, and we've got a pipeline. When the Exxon Bank was closed because the senators blocked our nominations, we got $40 billion in applications that came into us. But these four foreign applicants representing, they want to buy that much stuff, they're also applying to other export credit agencies at the same time. How many of you have taken out a loan? You know, maybe you shop around, right? And so they want the best deal. And uh, what we offer are great goods and services and uh, the stability of our country. But, uh, but $40 billion came in, so we're processing all those. It takes a long time to underwrite a deal. Just for this $5 billion deal that we, uh, we approved, um, the fees that they incur just doing all, all the paperwork, immense, and the time, and we want to do it correctly. 
But uh, so we're gonna we're gonna likely be there where it's more difficult. But yet when we have our small businesses, are any of you small business uh, small bus uh, head of small business or part of a small business? And how many of you have thought about exporting? It's a global marketplace, and you want to probably be competing out in that global marketplace and being more successful. So you would come to us for export credit insurance in case the foreign buyer doesn't pay up. And so we do those small transactions all the time everywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Chairman Reed. I'm from the College of Business and Economics, and we were so excited, the law we host you together here. My question is on the most recent, what's happening. If um, a world catastrophe, something happens, this threat of the corona violence, what happens to XM with your contracts? Is anything affected, or yeah. do you have a fail-safe? So that's, that's why we were created. We were really active during the uh, financial crisis so after 08. Um, in 09. So we're proactively monitoring what's on our book right now. And uh, we have strong legal protections in place. But what we do is we come in when American companies need us. And so there's a reason why all these small businesses use our export credit insurance product. And we will absolutely honor and pay up on everything that, that, uh, that we have. Not seeing anything right now, but we will see how uh, the world unfolds in the next uh, few weeks. Perhaps one or two more questions. Any any more questions? All right. So can I give you one tip before we go? Did you see me drink this? <laughs> Coca-Cola. So you all are going to be speaking as professionals uh, throughout your whole life. And Professor Bowman, I don't even know if you know this tip, so I hope I teach you something today. I was talking just like this at a conference, but I was uh, at a restaurant. It was an evening uh, dinner speech. And I started to feel that cough that comes on when you talk a lot. Probably you're going to feel it when you do appellate advocacy or uh, moot court competitions. And I know that once you start feeling that little tickle in your throat, you start coughing, that's it. And I'm, I'm giving this presentation in this restaurant. And I've been talking all day at a conference. This is our dinner for our board. And I start having this cough. And this bartender who's right at the bar next to where I'm speaking, like shoves a, a glass of Coke in my face and he's like, drink this. And I'm like, ugh, I hate Coke. Um, and he's like, just drink it. And I'm like, okay. And I did. And my throat immediately calmed down, unlike uh, when you drink water or you even suck on cough drops. So just know that anytime I have to testify before Congress on Wednesday, I will have a can of Coke in my bag. Um, because if you start coughing and it's forever, you're done, and it's bad, especially if the TV is filming you. Uh, so, but you have to get the, the high fructose corn syrup, the real stuff, not the diet, not the sugar Coke from Mexico. It's got to be the, the, the high fructose corn syrup, and that, coat, at least for me, coats your throat and instantly uh, makes you feel better. So that's my tip. Did you know that? Do you ever start coughing when all when you've talked so much? He uses scotch. He uses scotch. <laughs> and okay, one final point before I end. So so Professor Bowman, I was a shy 18-year-old, probably 19. It was 1993. How old was I? 22. Sorry, I was a shy 22-year-old when I drove down to Charleston and, and saw you give the speech to the National Young Republican Convention. I just inserted myself into this audience of young leaders from all over the country, sat down. I had no idea who you were. I uh, just uh, no focus. You made the hair stand up on my arms with your delivery of this speech about Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and I just want to impress upon everyone here that you really need to hear this guy speaks to speak and present because he'll help you uh, see how important it is to have your delivery. I don't think I did half half a, a job that you do. And uh, so I don't know if you'd like to come up here and say it how you normally say it. Do you remember anything about your speech about Lincoln that you'd like to come up here and say? And, and you know what? You know what? I quoted you verbatim. You know why? Because we have Google. And I didn't have a VCR and tape you back in 1993. 
but it is on C-SPAN's website. And uh, I watched it yesterday and I was stunned because guess who is in this audience of 100 people like a big shot on me. And uh, I couldn't even believe it that I was on uh, TV. I sent it to my dad last night. But, uh, but uh, Professor Bowman, if you're bored, Google, Google 1993 and, uh, and uh, about this conference because you'll see uh, how well he talks about what Abraham Lincoln did uh, for our country. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you.